Good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. We're on the road to Town Meeting 2020. This is going to be a very interesting year because we have one district with two seats up and that's as a result of Ashley Hill resigning. There's a one-year term and one candidate running and there's three candidates running for the two-year term that Glenn Hutchison had, uh, the seat he currently has but won't have because he isn't going to run again. Uh, in District 2, we only have an incumbent running, Connor Casey. In District 1, we only have an incumbent running, Donna Bate. You, you can see a trend developing. And uh, that's a very good show, by the way. Uh, we have Donna and Connor together in two half-hour shows discussing their view as incumbents on city government. That's a really good one if you can catch that. And we also have uh, Bill Fraser talking about the city budget. Now on the school side, you can see the same trend. Everyone who's running for school board is going to make it on. And we have all of them, an individual show for each. And all of those shows are excellent as well. And we have low, how about editing that? And we have Libby Bonesteel, our superintendent of the schools. And this is her first time with us. Libby, Thank welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And it's the first time because your school board president, Jim Murphy, was on last year with your budget. Yes, he was. When did you come in? I came to uh, Montpelier Roxbury last year, last fall. Last July was my first month on the job. And you came in from where? Franklin Northwest. I was the director of curriculum and instruction in Franklin Northwest, which is up in Missisquoi, Swanton area. Now, you had a hand in drafting last year's budget. I did. With your team. I did, with the team, yeah. What was that like? Your first budget with Montpelier parents sitting in front of you, <laughs> those parents at that meeting after meeting after meeting. What was that like? Uh, well, our team is pretty strong. So I have a very strong business manager in Grant Geisler, and we pretty much followed the same timeline and path that the district had been using in the past. Um, I was still, we start budget season in late September, very early October with internal discussions about what we need and and I was still learning a whole lot about the district at that point so we followed what had been set up um, we didn't make tremendous changes in our budget last year except for the busing increase uh, and could that, you explain the busing increase in last year's budget sure we had last year's budget we added busing to Main Street middle school students who live beyond a mile radius from the school um, and added that to our UES busing so that's principally kids out on Elm Street Yes. That's kids out on Terrace in that area. Yes. Kids out on Town Hill. Yes. And kids up the hill, right, on, on the south side. As if you're going up to Northfield. Right. And, the, and there's some also on, uh, I Hospital believe, Hill. Berry Street right. side there, too. Yep. Now, um, is that winter busing or is that a whole season busing? Whole season. Mm -hmm. You also had a change in capital in the structure yeah. of how you approach capital last year. Yep, so last year the voters voted on not only the school budget but also a capital plan. There were two separate items to vote on. It will be the same in this year's budget as well. There were two separate items to vote on. Um, and the capital plan was well in line by the time I took over. As okay, now what is a capital plan? A capital plan is a, a kind of a separate account that we use for building maintenance to, to ensure that we don't have deferred maintenance and that we have money in the bank in order to do larger projects so we can start to limit our reliance on bond projects and, and it, an enormous voter asks. Um, so it's, it's the fund for bigger projects that are coming down the line. How much is normally in that fund? You know, I'd have to look at our exact numbers from the, from the budget presentation, um, but it's, it's a considerable amount of money and that money can roll over over years so it's not refilled each year in the same way that a school budget would be refilled. It, um, so it, it rolls over if we use it or if we don't use it. This year in our capital projects, we're looking at window replacements. We have some, some different ideas. And that's, that, those uses are primarily run by Andrew LaRosa, who's our buildings and grounds facilities director. And in conjunction with Grant, Andrew knows our buildings better than anybody at this point. And um, he's was, the one. Wasn't he a new hire? He was last, he came in with me last year as well, yeah. Now, you inherited another project. You inherited Union Elementary's playground project. And, and the high school's auditorium project, yes. Now, the Union Elementary playground project came in on time. 
<laughs> well, it depends on whose timeline you were looking at. Some might, some might disagree with right, right. that. Right, right. It took a long, 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 you're right. It took a long, long time. But once those dump trucks were there, yes. it did open in time yes. for the school year. Yes. So when Andrew and I took over, we, were, we, we promised that we'd have it ready for the school year. And it came in. The, the final uh, construction work was done, I believe, two days before school started. And that's a very popular site now. Yes. Well, it's a beautiful playground. What is ongoing right now in, in capital expenditure? What, what are you working on presently? <clears throat> presently, we're making plans for what needs to be done for next year. Um, so those plans are in place already. Um, we are seeding the mud lot out of capital plans. OK. What is the, the mud, mud lot? I know what the mud lot yeah. is, but nobody else knows what it so is. So when you drive into Montpelier, from, Montpelier High School from Bailey Ave, the, where the circle, circle rotary is right there, Right in front of the auditorium, there's been a mud pit, basically, that people have, been, people have parked on over time. It's a very compacted surface. And we, for a long time, we were in talks with the bank across the street, um, and they wanted to, to pave it into a par real parking area that they would be able to use and rent the spaces for, from us over time. They decided it, the project was too expensive. So we went to the board, the school board to say, do you want us to pave it? Do you want it to be seated over? What would you like us to do? Um, we talked to them about parking, potential parking challenges if we, didn't, if we didn't pave it into a parking lot, but the board in the end decided to cede that space. What's going to happen with those potential parking spaces? Because over years, what, 30, some 30 cars? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've, we've terminated the contract with the bank. So the bank, and we had a contract going where their, their employees could use our parking spaces. Um, and when we decided not to paved this over, we said, we're just not going to have enough parking space for that. So um, bank employees no longer can park in our parking lot during the day. Um, that we can still use it for overflow parking for things like graduation and the very big events that will still be available for our spaces, just as we find lots of other spaces around the property for overflow parking in the, in the big time events. Um, and, but the, the high school parking lot will most likely be a permitted place moving forward simply because we don't have the parking space for faculty and staff if we, if we don't do it that way. Okay, let's, let's do an overview of the district. Sure. We've got four principal buildings. Uh, one is in Roxbury, three are in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. How many students are there at the Roxbury Village School right now? Currently there's 37 students in K-4 to and there are um, our preschool has 17 four-year-olds in it. Um, Union. So Union has over 400 students. I believe it's actually up to about 415 now in uh, pre-K to four. Main Street Middle School. Main Street Middle School has had a little influx, especially in the sixth grade this year. And so there are about 370 students in grades five, seven, six, seven, and eight. Did we pick up an extra teacher for that? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, are there any projected, well, we're going to get to this later, but are there projected extra teachers as that, um, as the snake swallows that yeah. particular thing and it goes yeah, up? Yeah, our cohort of sixth grade right now is very large. It's over, it's, I think it's at 102 right now, and just the sixth grade alone, 104 maybe. Um, so we did put in a sixth grade teacher this year, um, paying for it out of our fund balance. And next, what is a fund balance? So a fund balance is kind of the rainy day fund. Um, when, like I said, we have the best business manager in the state and grant. And um, when we when we don't when we budget for a certain thing and we get we come in under, that's a good thing. Um, but the money's already budgeted, so it goes into the fund balance. And the um, high school. The high school is about three sixty five right now in grades nine through twelve. Now, how does this compare? And I'm going to ask you for figures off the top of your head, so you could just say <laughs> well, forgive roughly. Forgive me if I don't know uh, it. <laughs> exactly. You could say roughly. How does this compare with last year? Are we up? Are we? We are increasing in enrollment. Yes. Uh, pro fewer than 50? More than 50? Uh, I believe it is a round 50. It would, would be a, probably a good round number of what we picked up this year. We had a very big increase at Main Street Middle School this year. Was that uh, due to Roxbury coming in? Not necessarily, no. What, what would bring an, an increase at, at the middle school like that if it's not showing up at, at Union Elementary? Are people coming in from those outer feeders in a way that they didn't? It would be all an assumption because we, we don't necessarily ask, um, but it could be that families are just moving in with those aged kids. Um, it could be that 
um, a lot of some parents in Montpelier decide to send their students to alternative schools um, or, or private schools and then decide to send their kids to Main Street Middle School or, or Montpelier High School because we had a big influx of 10th graders as well at Montpelier High School. Um, but we don't really know exactly where, why Are or where. Are any of these people tuitioning in? We have a few tuition students, yes. Have, does that trend continue? Or I, think, I think it's on the downflow, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure what the trend is across several years, but every year we have a few students who are tuitioned in. Uh, let's go to a budget summary. I'm, by the way, if you're following this, I'm following her document that she prepared for the board that you can find on her site in the budget section mm -hmm. on the Montpelier Roxbury School District site. And this will be there in a much bigger form and a much more detailed form. But we're going to walk through the highlights of that particular presentation mm -hmm. so that we avoid going into the weeds mm -hmm. in terms of, well, this number is this. You can, if you're interested in that, find it on their site. It's very easy to navigate. I can also say, Richard, that um, we do have a community budget forum on March 2nd at 5.30 at the high school in the library. As you always do before yes. town meeting day. Yes. Uh, which Orca, I believe, will show. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they did last year or not. I think we did. Yeah, okay. If we, if we don't, I'll request that we do. <laughs> right. Okay, the increase in education spending. So our increase in spending in, in education spending is 4.68% this year. Um, in spending per pupil, it's 3.51%. How does that compare with past years? You, you did last year's budget. Is that roughly what we're coming in at? Yes, yes. Is there any economy of scale since we're picking up students? Or are we such a small district that the numbers are too small that the addition on the margin will you know, affect these numbers tremendously? Um, our equalized people count actually did affect our numbers. So if you were to go... Okay, I'm going to stop you. Uh-huh. What is an equalized pupil count? <laughs> that's, that's a larger question. <laughs> uh, there are formulas that the AOE uses. AOE um, being? Agency of Education uses. Lots to, of acronyms tonight, yeah, folks. <laughs> to um, determine how many equalized pupils. So, for instance, high school students are weighted more than a preschool student is um, because preschool receives less education. Technically, they're there for less time. Um, kids who are on free and reduced lunch receive a different weight. Kids who come in with English as a different language receive a, a, another weight. So the AOE takes these identifiers and adds a weight to it. And what we get back, so it's not just one student, one dollar. It's what we, come, we get back based on our weighted count. Is that possible? It sounds so convoluted. It is, is ridiculously it, convoluted, yes. Is it possible for you to estimate that? I suppose you estimate it, but... Uh, at what point in the budget process are you sure exactly what that number is? The AOE gives it to us. This okay. year it came in rather late, um, which is why the budget presentation that's on the website um, says 3.77 increase when it's actually 3.51 because our equalized pupil count came in higher than we expected. Which is good. It's a good thing. Yes, <laughs> it's a very good thing. <laughs> um, special ed kids, are they weighted as well or is that a separate system all of its own? The kids with special needs are also weighted differently, yes. Um, in terms, how, how does that translate in terms of tax? Um, you know, Grant gave us the exact dollar amount. It, Again, and, I'm not going to hold you to yeah, it. Yeah, and it's, it's a significant one, one pupil, one equalized pupil more is something crazy, like a decrease, it would be the same as like decreasing our budget by $20,000. It's really a, a large factor. Um, so schools with decreasing enrollment, that significantly influences their budget. And for us, because we have increasing enrollment, it influences our budget, but in a better way. Um, it's a we'd have to decrease our budget monetarily quite a bit if we had lower enrollment. So let me understand this. You're starting this process in September or early mm -hmm. October without knowing mm -hmm. what that number is that, that will determine the ultimate cost in a house. Yes. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the, we're not alone. We're not unique. It's the way the system is currently set up. Um, there are some things that we can control and some factors we can control, and then some factors we can't. So when we're looking at our budget um, this year in particular, with my leadership team, we sat down in a room for a long period of time, several long periods of time, 
and put up on our walls at all of our needs and wants and desires. And then we started prioritizing as a team from there. Um, and once that those priorities start to get limited, then Grant will start, start to put some approximate numbers. We can see trends over time and make very educated guesses for some pieces like CLA and equalized people that come in. Um, we're, we have to wait for the state to get the exact amounts, however. And so if those, those original numbers start coming in too high, then we come back to the drawing board and we say, okay, we have to prioritize further. Now, you have budget themes. The, yes. The, the board sets themes that you're working within. They set priorities that you're working within. Mm -hmm. What would those themes be, the broad themes that the yeah. board is trying to achieve in this budget? So our four pillars that we're standing on right now is ensuring that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum, that we have an effective... Okay, I'm going to stop you. What is a viable curriculum? Viable is that the teachers can teach it. Okay, that's um, viable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, if the Common Core were, were taught as stated, a student would need about 22 years of schooling in order to master all of them. <laughs> um, so we have to prioritize. So the guaranteed and viable are saying these are the prioritized bit of these standards or whatever standards document we're working within. Um, and and we, we can, we're going to guarantee it to each kid and we're going to make it viable for teachers. So it's not too much. Now does that relate to the proficiency-based graduation? Yeah, that's been absolutely. Implemented? So that's driving these viable standards? Yeah. So each priority standard that we call it um, has a proficiency scale attached to that. And that's how we assess whether students are making sufficient progress. Those are our markers for proficiency, yes. And then in order to graduate, a student has to hit those markers of proficiency by the time they yes. reach the point of trying to graduate. Yes. Yep. How are we doing in that transition? Um, I think we're in a really nice spot right now. Montpelier High School in particular was a leader in this in the state from the get-go and they put some systems and supports in to make this happen um, through excellent communication and a staff that was ready to, to work and change. They made some significant changes early. Now I believe we're at the point where we've been doing a certain system within proficiency-based learning for a while and we're ready to say, is this the best way? Um, is this, is this the, now that we know more, you, when, you, when you know more, you do differently, right? And so now Montpelier High School, as, long, uh, well, as well as Main Street, Roxbury, and Union are looking at our systems and saying, is this what we want to say? Is this what we want to do? Are there places that we can tweak and change to make those more supportive for students? Now, what about um, the gap, the achievement gap? Mm -hmm. So I'm not my four pillars. So one okay. is a guaranteed <laughs> and viable curriculum. Um, the second pillar that we're standing on is collaborative practices and collective responsibility. Okay, what is a collaborative practice? Yeah, so that's called professional learning communities. Um, and what we want all of our teachers in is a team. So getting all kids to learn at high levels, which is the soapbox I continue to stand on because of what we do every day, um, is we can't do that individually. It's just too complicated and too complex. So we're putting in systems and cultures that ensures that we have collaborative practices. That means teachers are, act, are collaborating over, let's look at what is it we want all kids to learn? How do we know they've learned it? What do we do if they've already know it? They already know it. And what do we do if they, can't, if they don't know it yet? Um, so teachers are working in teams, mostly grade level in the younger grades and in more, more content area based in, the, in seven through 12. Um, but they're working together to decide to look at practices and figure out which ones are working and let's get rid of the ones that aren't um, in order to reach our priority standards. Now, I know that you're a data-driven superintendent. I am, yeah. How does that factor in? So we use data to decide if, if that's our evidence to see what practices are working and what's, what aren't working. Um, and, and the idea that we're not there yet. So our data, in some of our data, it's pretty good. Our more subjective qualitative data says that we're producing pretty good graduates with the help of our community partners and our help of our parent community. Many of our graduates are going on to do phenomenal things. You were just talking about your son, son before <laughs> the camera started. Um, so many of our graduates are really doing just amazing things in the field right now. We have some that aren't, that, that aren't making the mark in the way that their life wants them to make the mark. So we want to ensure <laughs> that when somebody graduates from the Montpelier Roxbury school system, that they have choices in life and that those choices are going to make a difference for themselves, their communities, their families. 
um, a positive difference, hopefully. <laughs> um, and we need to ensure that's happening. We have to have the evidence for that. Now, well before you came into this district, <coughs> we had an Excuse academic me. achievement gap between students of lower income who are on subsidized lunches and food stamps mm -hmm. and other students who aren't. That's not something that came in with you from another district. How are things changing in, in that? How, how do we address that population yeah. to try and bring them up closer and closer to where everyone else is? Yeah, so my other two pillars, <laughs> besides guaranteed we're, viable we're getting curriculum, there. you're getting there, and collaborative practices and collective responsibility. The next one would be effective multi-tiered systems of support. Excuse me, I have a cough. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that we ensure that learning is the variable and not time. So often... Okay, stop. <laughs> learning is a variable and not time. So, I'm sorry. Time is a variable, not learning. Sorry. See, I, I knew that, that was wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, edit that out. So what we want to say is that we will give students, based on our priorities, based on our priority standards and the guaranteed and viable curriculum, we will give students the time they need to master those, to show proficiency in those standards. And some students may need to be pulled into smaller groups to do that. They need to be retaught in different ways. We need to spiral around so that they have multiple opportunities to learn. But the learning is not the variable. The learning is going to be the expectation. Um, so that would be our third pillar there, is, is, this, is an effective multi-tiered system of support. We have multi-tiered system of support now. We've always had multi-tiered systems have, of support. We're, what we're working on is the effective part, and that's where the data comes in as well. The data will tell us whether or not we are effective in that. What's the fourth pillar? Uh, so the fourth pillar would be high-quality instruction in every single classroom. Uh, so this, this school year, kind of behind-the-scenes work, the administrators, the leaders and principals, director of curriculum and instruction, director of student support services, myself, assistant principals, have been working on coming to consensus on what do we exactly do we mean when we say high quality instruction. We've been working with some, a document called the 5D, which is five dimensions of instruction out of the University of Was Washington's Center for Creative Leadership, um, or Center for Educational Leadership, sorry. And uh, we've been working closely with a consultant, Michelle Mason, out of that group, some of the principals and myself. And then we've been coming back with the team, working two times a month on watching video of teaching, being in classrooms together, then coming back and saying, what are the themes we're noticing? What is it? How would we provide feedback to these teachers? How do we get at intentional planning around ideas? We've been doing that work together. It's been a big learning year for the leadership team around that. Um, and, and at the end of this year, we'll be thinking, how do we begin really truly working with the staff around the 5 Ds so that we all have a very common understanding of what we mean when we say high quality instruction? In terms of high quality instruction, Montpelier has a, a very senior teacher's core. Yeah, we do. That's a, at the high end of the scale, but at the same time probably worth being at the high end of the scale in, in spades. Mm -hmm. uh, is that teaching core going to stay together or is it gradually retiring? Um, I think we have, this year we have, I believe, three retirements that are happening. Um, Any names so that you far? can remember off the top of your head? Because those of us who don't have kids in school know those people. Yeah, uh, so just the other day, Mary Mello gave me her letter of resignation, who is a long time kindergarten teacher at Union Elementary School. Um, it was a very hard decision for her, and I loved her. She handed me a letter. She goes, I've never retired before. I'm not sure I'm so, <laughs> how I do this. I was like, well, you just kind of give that to me, and that's it. Um, so Mary's retiring, of course. Uh, Pam Arnold's retiring at Main Street Middle School with Linda Principal. Goodell as well, and uh, her administrative assistant, Lisa Moody, at the, at the Main Street, a sixth grade teacher, is also retiring. Boy, she's been principal for so long. That 14 years. I was a parent on the committee that chose Pam oh, yeah? Yes, I was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyone else? That comes um, to off the top of my head. Those are the biggies off the top of my head. Now, let's get to one elephant in the, in the room on, on your budget. Mm -hmm. The increase due to health care costs. Mm -hmm. it, it wreaked havoc on the city budget. And you can tell because Bill discusses it on Bill's show that's well worth mm -hmm. watching. What did it do to your budget? Well, you can see the health care, the health rates increased 12.9%. This is not a Montpelier Roxbury number. This is a statewide number. So, Why? Why is it a statewide number? Um, it's set by the state. It's the, In a collective? It, yeah. Yeah. So this isn't just unique to us. Um, Was we, it anticipated? 
It's a considerable raise. Um, it's hard to anticipate that number. It was a considerable bump from last year to this year. I can't remember exactly what that number was, but I believe it's a 3% increase. I'm not positive on that, though. Um, and so that is, that is isn't. we get that number early in the budget season, though. That is not like the equalized pupil number. That comes in relatively early, so we can, we can factor that in in the beginning of the process. Did that constrain the board from new spending initiatives? Not that particular piece. In terms of the budget itself, mm -hmm. let's go into some of the things that the budget did in terms of staffing. Yeah. So we have an uh, increase in English language learners, um, particularly at Union Elementary School. And so we've increased that teaching staff by 0.2 FTE. English language learners would be what we used to call uh, ESL, English yes. as a Second Language? Yes. Yep. So you can tell how old I am? <laughs> yep. So students who come in with, with multiple languages. Um, that we have, our buildings are a considerable asset to the community and a um, highly desired space on the weekends, which makes our custodial crew work a whole lot of overtime. Um, we have some custodians currently who have worked every day of the week for two straight months. Uh, so we've put in a weekend custodian in order to try to alleviate that on our, we want to make sure that we keep our custodial core and not overwork them <laughs> to death. So we put in a weekend custodian, that's 0.4 FTE. Um, and FTE being? Uh, both the, in, the employment amount that they work during a week. So it would be one fourth of 40 hours in theory. Right, okay. right. Equals about two days, 0.4 would equal about two days. Um, the after school enrichment is already in the budget, actually. Um, it just wasn't in the budget for last year. So, so that, it was in the budget last year as a different piece, it was the after school program. Could you talk about the after school program? That's something different than, than we've had in the past with community connections. Mm -hmm. So we currently have, are working with part two at for our kindergarten through fifth grade students, which is an organization out of Chittenden County. Um, they've come in to rave reviews um, to the programming that they're offering our kindergarten through what, fifth what graders. What kinds of programs would those be off the top of your head? What just the kids do? A, on a yeah, just a sample of what, what <laughs> kids have offered after school. Uh, so they, they join in, into the, that, that level joins into that program and then they have, they have a whole calendar of events that kids can, they have different choices for kids during the day, whether it's different cool crafts or um, I know they're playing in fifth grade a lot of football outside because it's a bunch of boys who are in the, in the program. Um, they are outside quite a bit through nature and nature hikes and that kind of thing. Um, Is building. there a copay involved for parents? Um, and then we also, that after school enrichment, however, is for a position um, that works with our grades five through 12, offering uh, mountain biking after school and kayaking and skiing and, and that kind of piece. So again, there'll be a, a parent's copay that will generate some revenue for the district. You have to, you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, our librarian, <laughs> what's yeah, going on with that? Yeah, uh, Roxbury Village School does have a librarian what they do not have is a technology integrationist, um, and so that point too is so that the librarian can also serve as a technology integrationist in the classroom. Okay, you, you've lost me. I'm, I'm too old. What is a technology integrationist? Somebody who can work with teachers on how to increase their capacity to um, bring technology and globalized learning into the, into the classroom. Now, Union Elementary picks up. Yep, this is actually happening this year. Um, that's why it says status quo in our budget presentation. Because of Act 166, which is the universal pre-K law with the legislation. When did that come in? Uh, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a few years. Um, there's certain licensure requirements for all preschools uh, who qualify for Act 166 dollars from the state. Act 166 being? The preschool, the preschool. universal preschool law. And um, Head Start, which is our part of our program that's offered at UES, uh, had some trouble year after year hiring a licensed teacher, and so the, the program was in jeopardy. So what we did this year was ask the board to make our, what was currently 0.5 preschool teacher into a full-time pre-K teacher. Um, and so the board did that, again, out of fund balance. Um, and so what we see in the budget this year is to ensure that that status quo happens. 
Now, Main Street Middle, it, like the snake that swallowed something, Main Street Middle is going to yep. actually see that rising from the elementary school and from other people coming in. And that particular grade six, um, large grade six cohort, so we've put in the staffing a grade seven, eight teacher, um, a full-time teacher there. Main Street Middle School also is the only school in um, our district, with the exception of Roxbury, who does not have any position dedicated to social emotional learning supports or behavior supports. Um, and it's needed it's <laughs> to have no. Those are middle school. Yeah, school. <laughs> exactly. To have uh, to, to have a weekend behavior program at the middle school is not what we want. Um, so a behavior position is in place for Main Street Middle School, full time teaching position. Um, we've added some athletics there in terms of Nordic skiing, track, boys lacrosse, um, and then some co-curricular work as well. I think we're putting a musical in there, aren't we? Yeah, looks like it, yep. How about our high school? What's happening on the margin? Yeah, so at the high school, one of the things we wanted to do, um, again, going to our social-emotional learning, uh, we are not um, unique in that we have a lot of students coming to all of four of our schools with significant um, backgrounds and mental health challenges uh, and we don't have the current programming in place to to be able to serve them well um, so at main street or i'm sorry at montpelier high school it's being proposed to create an alternative therapeutic program um, with we have some people in place the the planning is still being done kind of waiting to see if, if the budget passes before we do significant serious planning but some ideas are being thrown around that's a more outdoor education program um, building leadership confidence with a licensed social worker so this would be another one of those paths to, to proficiency yes it could be yes yeah now what is a path to proficiency so with flexible pathways law um act 77 the the legislature says that there's multiple ways a student can show proficiency, um, and, and Montpelier High School is is a state leader. In, we were doing that before the law. Yeah, different different opportunities with our com community-based partnerships. Thank you very much, community, and um, different. The community-based partnership for those of you who know Matt McLean is is yes. Matt McLean. Yeah, he's the he's the director. Of right. Matt, yes. Now, what is that? Uh, so we have a department at the high school that when kids want to explore different options, different career options or different experiences, uh, we make it happen for them. So we've had students who have done community-based partnerships in beekeeping, in archaeology, in music. Um, in all, state government. In state government, all over the place, uh, in social justice action. And, and it's, it's really an amazing opportunity. I believe a large percentage of Montpelier High School students have done that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We last year, I believe, in the second half of the year, we had 77 students in a in some sort of community-based learning. But by the time they get out of that school, most will have done. Many have, yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, what about fine arts? Fine arts. So currently, our fine arts offering at the high school is band, orchestra, chorus, or art. Um, our art classes have a considerable wait list every single year. Um, and we have one art teacher. So we increased well, we our- we lost an art teacher last year, I believe. We did, unfortunately, she, she passed away. Right. And, and uh, Liz Wendell, who was her student teacher, who was Barb's student teacher, took over, which was fantastic. Um, and Liz is awesome, and kids love her, and she's a fabulous teacher, and there's a wait list for her class. <laughs> it's a significant wait list. So how will this affect the significant wait list? What we'd like to do is add a fine arts, because it is a graduation requirement. We do have to have a proficiency in fine arts, so we want to add more opportunity and more choice to our students. What is going on in the guidance section? Yeah, so the state is requiring districts um, to provide more data collection um, in a relatively complex manner. And so we had a data manager position in the district, but that data manager position also served as a guidance assistance for, for power school and data management. Because of the complexity of what the state is demanding us to do, we needed that data manager to solely work for the district and the data management piece. Um, so the point five you see in guidance assistance is to work with the guidance department and their data needs. Now, Roxbury is picking up someone to help them with technology integration. The we high school do. is as well. Yeah, so this live, uh, well the library assistant at the, at the high school is slightly different. That is a true instructional assistant. 
if anybody has been to the library at the high school, they know that Sue Monami, who's our librarian there, is long time top librarian. of the not, top of everything. I love her. Um, and so Sue will be playing the librarian technology integrationist role, but in order to free her up to do that, she needs an assistant at the high school. It's the same model that Main Street Middle School currently has. Do we, we've got after school activities at the high school. Yes, we do. What kind of activities? Would, the, would those be basically the same as at the middle school? Sometimes. Um, I know mountain biking and, the, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of uh, weightlifting and health and fitness offerings. There's also a writing club um, that's happening, creative writing that's happening at the high school this year. Um, Drew, who's, who's our after school enrichment coordinator, is still building that program. Now, I'm going to show you something, so you're going to be looking down mm -hmm. at program expenses. Mm -hmm. Anything catch your eye there? As an increase, as a decrease? Uh, the co-curricular in athletics has a significant increase. We're adding some middle school opportunities for kids. Um, and some of that will be offset by co-payment? Not, not the things that are, that are after. Okay. The after school enrichment, yes, um, because it's just slightly, it's, Again, we had it last year. It was just written differently in the budget this year, so this is just to clar clarify that. Um, but the spelling team, um, the fall musical, and then three additional coaches for three additional athletic opportunities would increase that budget quite a bit. Um, one of the things, there's a group that's meeting on Main Street Middle School on, on the very site itself to yes. discuss. Where are those athletic activities happening? There, there's not a whole lot of land over yeah. on Main Street. The Main Street outdoor activities happen either at the high school or Dog River Fields and other rec fields in the, in the city. Roxbury kids, mm -hmm. how do they get home from this afternoon stuff? Do we have a bus? We have bus? a late bus. We have yeah, a late van. <laughs> so kids have to um, tell, let the office know that they're staying after, and we have a late van that runs any kids home that need it around 5 o'clock every night. Okay, so those kids integrate into the after-school curriculum in the district? There's a, they can if they want to, yes. Just like uh, any other kid. Um, I'm going to take you through what you're going to... It's the only graph from the entire table that you're going to see behind <laughs> us, and it's the enrollment projection. Yes. And if you look behind us, you can see that the numbers are going to be really, really tiny. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not going to sit and deal a whole lot. You can see the numbers on the x-axis going down, and you can see the years on the y-axis going across. Um, what is going on with, with the high school in terms of enrollment in the long term? And this is until 2023, 20, 24. It's increasing. What, right. What, it's increasing. It's slowly increasing. And then it, it takes a slight dip downwards. Yeah. Of course, these are models. So that projection for 23, year 23, 24 is projecting from what's at UES right now. So UES was at an increase for several years, a significant increase It's for several years. Right now it's plateauing a bit, and so that plateau will be represented then. But it must be tough projecting those sixth graders going into seventh grade where we don't know exactly where they're coming from yeah, and exactly yeah. why, whether that's a temporary bounce or whether it's a yeah. permanent trend. All of this is modeling. So, <laughs> so in the future it's all models of what we can predict. How do we model the Main Street Middle School in terms, on, on this chart behind us? Very similar ways. We look at the population from UES and, and we extrapolate out. Now UES has a slight downward trend as well. Going forward. So that's based on, that is the, that is the number that is the most insecure on the model. How so? so it's based on kindergarten birth rate, um, or it's based on kindergarten, kindergartners that from birth rates five years prior. Um, and so we all know that's not a, if a child was born in Montpelier five years ago, they may or may not be there. We don't, we don't have a track record of that. So it's based on birth rates from, from years prior. Now I imagine that you're working along with the Development Corporation and the like in terms of kids who aren't born in Montpelier, whose parents are moving into Montpelier mm -hmm in possible new housing in places like Sabin's Pasture. Mm -hmm. Does that factor at all into this? Or people like my wife and myself who might actually sell our house in Montpelier to a family 
that has a couple of kids. As, we as hope we, you do. <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of people hope I'm going to be out of this community. But, no, not that way. Then we hope if you sell, you sell it to wife. a family they, with family with kids. They would love her to stay. <laughs> well, we're not getting into my family situation. But how do you deal with an elder, an aging population here, uh, with housing stock that can accommodate a great number of families? Mm -hmm. The housing stock, I don't believe, is is put into those models at all. It's, it's strictly based on birth rate. So if our housing stock increases, that hopefully will increase our enrollment even more. Or people who used to have families choose to downsize or mm -hmm. something. Exactly. That level. Exactly. Yep, and from what I hear, the housing market in Montpelier is hot, and it continues to be hot. So On the other side of that equation, the housing market in Montpelier is very expensive. It is. It and is, is yep. difficult for younger families to buy into. Yep, because they're not necessarily first-time houses. Absolutely. Yep. But, you know, that must be a very difficult model to put together. It is. It is. And you yep. can see the assumptions that are in those bubbles that are sitting behind us. Yeah. What's the strength of the Montpelier School District? Ah, there's so many. Um, there are absolutely so many. I'd say that our desire to, um, and our expectation, quite frankly, to, cr to create graduates in partnership with families in the community um, who have an incredibly well-rounded experience and graduate ready to take on any challenge that is put their way, I think that's our, that's our strength. We provide multiple opportunities from pre-kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade for kids to be experiencing the world in multiple ways um, and showing their learning in multiple ways. And we're only going to get better. In the challenges, I'm going to walk you through a couple mm -hmm. that I walked Jim Murphy, our, our current chair who's running for office again and has his own show. Um, safety in the schools. How so? In what way? Uh, in terms of children feeling safe, parents feeling that their children are safe in our schools. That's a macro issue. In terms of the macro. A absolutely. Uh, so currently, we're changing. We're, we came in um, with safety plans that were a little all over the place. Um, and we've spent the last year and a half with Andrew LaRosa, our buildings and grounds facility, leading the way of pulling those together. So we currently have one crisis plan instead of four crisis plans. Um, our, we have a close partnership with Montpelier um, Police Department and Fire so that they know very well what our plans are. Um, and you have a resource officer in the schools as you've had for years. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and Matt Nisley has held that position. Matt got promoted to detective. Um, and now Diane, who also, who's been working closely with Matt, is, is taking over in April. Now, do you feel that, that parents, now parents have to screw, everybody has to, ring the buzzer to get into the yes. school. Do students feel safer? Um, you'd have to ask the students. I think that this is a, the, I mean, this is larger than Montpelier Roxbury, Absolutely. of course. It's a, it's a um, macro issue. Um, I would like to say that our schools are as safe as we can make them um, and that we are prepared should, should horrendous things happen. Um, I, there's no guarantee there, of course, and it's a very hard topic for all of us to grapple with and digest. Um, so I'd say, yeah, we're, we're a safe school and we've taken measures and steps and plans to ensure that every, everybody who needs to know knows what to do in, in a time of crisis. The board has taken a lot of steps in terms of, we, we're a homogenous state, you know, mm -hmm. we are a white state. In terms of ethnic minorities, in terms of minorities as a whole, can you discuss that as it relates to the, the work that the board has done in terms of integrating students of all kinds and making them feel welcome. Yeah, it was just this morning, the Main Street Middle School raised the Black Lives Matter flag in front of the building to cheers from the crowd, um, which was wonderful to see. So your email box will be full by the end of the day from <laughs> people be. who you know, could be. Um, didn't like so that. So far, <laughs> not so much, but it could be. Uh, so. The board last year took steps by being one of the only boards in the state to, to ratify a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Um, what were the highlights of that policy? Uh, the highlights of that policy is that we will, we will look closely at data around learning for all of our um, historically marginalized groups or kids that are, have identifying factors to them, that we will uh, t learn and how to take steps to hire a more diverse staff. Staff, um, 
as a result of that policy, we have a district-wide equity and inclusion team um, that includes parents and teachers and myself and administrators. Um, it's being facilitated by a parent and community member, so we have another parent coming on board to talk about what exactly does equity mean for us and what steps can we take. Right, Our next meeting will be planning a parent night around um, this topic. So we're working very hard. We, we are a school, that, school district that still sees microaggressions between our students, small little acts that oftentimes kids aren't thinking about what they're saying and how that could influence and affect others. Um, we still see it. We're not immune to that in any way, shape, or form. And so we're learning how do we how do we support all kids and create safe spaces? How do we teach kids, use those, use those microaggressions as learning opportunities to say, this is what that means. Like, do we really want to go there? Um, and, and how do we use those to move forward together as a, as a whole community? My wife and I were walking home with the dogs one evening, and we walked routinely by Union Elementary. Mm -hmm. And there's a very well-attended parents meeting yes. or community meeting on transgender and non-conforming students. Mm -hmm. What would have been covered in that meeting? Um, I wasn't there, <laughs> so I'm not positive. But the initiative dealing with transgender and, and non-conforming students. Yeah, I wouldn't call it an initiative. It's, just, it's another place where we want to encourage the safety of all students. Uh, we have a, a rather large student population who, uh, who are working through gender identity um, ideas. And so the, the I would imagine that it, the conversation was around how do we support all kids? How do we talk to our kids about these issues? These, for people my age who have students in, who are potentially in the elementary schools, it may be a new concept for us to, to be talking to our kids about. And how do we do that well um, so that our kids are coming in welcoming and our kids are making friends with all kinds of kids and having all kinds of different experiences? So as you submit this budget, in an elevator speech of, a, of about 15 to 30 seconds, why should we vote for the budget? It's building our capacity um, and ensuring that we have equitable services across all four buildings. Uh, it has a focus, a strong focus, on building our capacity for social emotional learning, uh, which is a need in our buildings. And we want to make sure that we have a culture and a climate and, a, and our, our human resources are well trained and well ready for any kind of challenge that comes our way. And this is a nice stepping stone towards that. There's one initiative that's not in the budget that got so much publicity during the year in front of the school board, and that's language immersion in the elementary school. Mm -hmm. What's the status of that right now? It didn't make it into this budget. What is, no. it, what is going on? Last year's budget had $20,000 for a study put aside through a, with a consultant, um, with a national consultant. And that work is happening currently. It's being led by Mike Berry, who's our director of curriculum and technology. Um, they are kind of in the final stages of that work now. It was not ready for this year's budget. We weren't in a place that we could propose anything. Any idea when that will be presented to the new board? It should be presented within the, within the coming months. So there's a possibility that this might actually integrate into the following year's budget? If, it, if it's going to go, then yes, it would be in If in it the requires following. new spending? Yes. Yeah, if it does. Libby, I really want to thank you. This has been an excellent show, and it's been a real learning experience for me. Thank you for Thanks coming. Thanks for having me. Anytime. And I want to talk to you now, and I want to urge you to watch all of the shows. Libby's is not the only good show. Uh, Bill Fraser's show on the city budget was really good. Um, all of the school board candidates presented their view of what's going on in the district and what should go on in the district, and I thought those were excellent shows. Uh, the show with Connor... Uh, Casey and Donna Bate was a really, really good show, as were all the ones with the people from District 3. And I'd be remiss in um, saying, and I forgot her the first time through, uh, Ann Watson has yeah. a show. Your, your <laughs> physics teacher. Yes, she's awesome. And our mayor. Uh, <laughs> she has a show that's really good. It's an hour long, broken into two segments. And Ann presents a state of the city in that. And states why she believes that Montpelier is a dynamic place to work and to live, mm -hmm. as Libby did yes. in her own way, and as I will. It's a dynamic and great place to live if you come out and vote. And if you support your community, get out and vote. And make sure your family and friends do, too. Town meeting is not simply an old tradition here. It's what binds our community together. Thank you very much for watching.